Hello everybody, just wanted to cover um, a bit more uh, regarding our first law of tables and the first law of thermodynamics we've been talking about so far. So we have um, this relationship, which we call the first law of thermodynamics, that any change in the thermal energy comes from one of two contributions, either the heat that leaves or enters the gas, or the work done uh, on or by the gas. And we have talked about the work, the mechanical work, it's force times distance, and it's if the gas is compressed or expanded, we have some non-zero work. Um, and we've talked about how heat is exchanged in terms of being exposed to something at high temperature or being exposed to something at low temperature. This non-mechanical exchange of energy is the heat. And delta E thermal for a gas that doesn't undergo any phase changes is simply the change in temperature in different units. And we want to iron out some of these details here in terms of quantifying these different terms, specifically Q and delta E thermal, since we already can interpret the work as being the area under the curve on the PV diagram, and we can calculate uh, the integral in the case of the isothermal case, or the isothermal situation. We've already handled the work, but we want to focus now on Q and W and uh, come up with some mathematical um, expressions for those two. And so i um, going to start here with So we'll call this the specific heat of gases. And for this example, or illustration or explanation, we're going to start here with PV diagram. And we're going to consider <clears throat> um, an initial state that is at one temperature. I'm going to sketch the isotherm in here. And it goes to a final state which also lies on, I mean, every point lies on an isotherm, but it goes to one of two final states, either one uh, on this isotherm through an isochoric process or constant volume process, or one over here, uh, which would be a constant pressure process, and we end up at the same final temperature in both cases. So we have initial, and then we have process A, which goes uh, the isochoric route, and we have process B, which goes the isobaric route. And so both of these, since they have the same initial and final temperature, they're going to have uh, both path A and both path and path B are going to have the same um, change in the thermal energy because that only depends on the temperature if we don't have a phase change involved. And so we have the same delta E thermal for both processes, but we're going to have different Qs and W because clearly we have no work in case A because the volume doesn't change, the area under that curve is zero, and we have some finite work along path B. And so, as we talked before, um, we know that both of these involve a change. Um, we know that both of these involve a change in temperature. They're going from one initial temperature to a final temperature. And we've already discussed our change in thermal energy equation is equal to NC delta T. And <clears throat> in the case of the path A here, where the work is zero, where we have delta E thermal, is equal to Q plus W. Um, if we don't have any work, if the work is zero, which is the true along path A, then we have that the change in the thermal energy along path A is all due to the heat contribution Q. And we know that this is NC delta T. And so this is going to be equal to Q. I'm going to call this Q sub V because it's a constant volume. Um, and we're also going to call this NCV delta T. So we end up with an expression Q sub V, which is the heat exchange in a constant volume process, is equal to NCV delta T. And so this is true for only isochoric processes only. Our original expression for the change in the thermal energy, delta E thermal, equals NC delta T. Well, we're going to keep the CV there, which is a crummy part of notation, but it's what your book goes with, and so we're going to go with it too, uh, delta T. Notice there is no subscript over here on delta E thermal. That's because the delta E thermal, this is true for all processes. This is an important distinction here, um, that this delta E thermal equals NCV delta T is true for all processes, whereas QV is equal to NCV delta T. This is true for isochoric processes only. And now let's consider the 
path B. We've just talked here about path A. So um, along path B, we have, um, well, let me write down what we started with here. We have the change in the thermal energy along path A um, is equal to uh, work plus Q, and this goes to zero. And <clears throat> so this is equal to NCV delta T. And then the change in the thermal energy along path B is also equal to the work done along path B plus the heat exchanged along path B. And that's going to be equal to constant pressure times the change in volume delta V um, plus whatever Q at constant pressure is going to be. Um, and that is equal to minus P delta V. Uh, and we're going to propose a form for this. Um, N times CP, where CP is some different constant times the change in temperature delta T, because it's a difference in temperature that drives the heat exchanged. Um, so we would suspect this is a reasonable uh, method for that, right? Now this, well, I'm gonna leave that with that. And so um, just taking this right-hand side, we have minus P times delta V uh, plus NCP delta T, and we're gonna pair that up with the equation over here well, these are equal to one another, so we can set that equal to this NCV delta T. So we have NCV delta T is equal to minus P times delta V plus N times CP times delta T. And what can we do with this? Well, we have this delta V here. So um, we also know the ideal gas law, PV is equal to NRT. And in this particular process, we're maintaining constant pressure still. Um, and so we're gonna do kind of a janky differential here where we do a delta and apply it to both sides of this equation. And we end up with P delta V is equal to NR times delta T, assuming everything else is constant. We don't have any product law to deal with, our product rule. Um, and so now we can substitute this in for this expression, this P delta V up here, and we end up with NCV delta T equals, um, and we're going to substitute this in, minus NR times delta T. Uh, plus NCP delta T. And you will see that the Ns and the delta Ts cancel from all of these terms. And we end up with CV um, is equal to CP minus R, or CP is equal to CV plus R. All right. So if we take a look at our equation sheet, in our thermodynamics section, we have this relationship, Cp is equal to Cv plus R. Oops, not what I want to do. Go back, mark up. Okay, so we have Cp is equal to Cv plus R. And down here at the bottom in the constant section, we have R. And we're also given CV for a monatomic gas and CV for a diatomic gas. So between those sets of constants, you can get all four CP monatomic, CV monatomic, CP diatomic, and CV diatomic. And then it's just a matter of calculating the change in the thermal energy, or Q. Um, Q depends on process, so we can calculate Q for a constant pressure process now um, by using this expression. We can also calculate Q for a constant volume process because it's just equal to the change in the thermal energy when the work is zero. All right, um, I'm gonna save the examples for the end based on the time that I have available to record this right now. Um, the examples will be coming in a follow-up video for this. So this is just the lecture presentation. The next thing I wanna talk about is um, adiabatic processes. It's our last named process. So for this, um, have a demo. I'll have to add. I'll have to add the demo later. Once again, I'm trying to get a video ready so you guys can watch this during class time. Um, so this demo works like this. It's a pretty good one, and I actually bought this demo for home use because I like it so much. And uh, for home use, I say my kids like it though. So imagine we have a tube, and it's sealed at the end, and um, so it's just a thick-walled glass tube here. And in the bottom of this tube, we put a small piece of cotton fuzz. And then we take this thing, and uh, I did a bad job drawing this here, so I'm going to give myself some more room. 
and we have a plunger that fits nice with a rubber seal goes on the top of this thing like this so now it's a nice sealed piston and I very quickly smash down on this thing and what happens is you'll notice that that piece of fuzz whoosh, combusts bursts into flames pretty amazing actually so what does the fact that we're doing it quickly change about this situation well with an isothermal process that was also a external force being applied but we applied it very slowly we'll let the force go slowly why did we have to apply it slowly in an isothermal process we go slow so that heat can be exchanged with environment. in response to work. So for instance, if we have, we compressing it, and we do some work in, then we have, we wait around so we have some Q out that equals, and we can have delta T equals, or you know, change in the thermal energy equals zero for an isothermal process. Now, if we go quickly, there's not room for Q to let that energy that we're adding to the system get out. So it all stays in. So an adiabatic process is one that's, we have a well insulated container, and it transpires quickly, and so Q is equal to zero. And the distinguishing characteristics is it's well insulated, so we're blocking that exchange of energy due to a difference in temperature, and it happens quickly. This is one of the sort of keywords that we use to clue you in that we're talking about an adiab adiabatic process is that if we say it evolves quickly. On the PV diagram, what does this look like? Well, we know that the temperature increases. So if these lines here represent two isotherms, and we have some initial state right here, and we rapidly decrease the volume. So the volume, we're going to the left on this. The adiabatic is, bat is going to be steeper to the, than the isotherm because we're increasing in temperature. So the adiabat is steeper than the isotherm. That's really all you need to know about it. I'm not expected to recognize the adiabat sort of in isolation without any context. But if you have an isotherm and you know, there's another curved uh, process on that plot, you can safely assume that it's adiabatic. So um, in terms of the mathematics, um, the, the derivation of these is, um, you know, beyond the scope of, of this class. I really never actually derived them, but I will just give you the answers in terms of how we relate these two. Now, if we have some initial pressure and volume uh, at state one, so we have some P1 and some V1 here, and up here we have some P2 and V2, then Along the adiabat, we have that P1 times V1 to the gamma power is equal to P2 times V2 to the gamma power, where gamma is defined to be the ratio of CP over CV. And yeah, I, I will go ahead and leave that there. We have values for monatomic and diatomic gases that are on your equation sheet. We have 1.67 is a monatomic value for gamma, and gamma is 1.40 for diatomic gas. And the work done in an adiabatic process is equal to, um, well, we have some P final, V final, uh, minus P initial, V initial, divided by one over gamma. That will give you the work. And yeah, that's really all I have to say about adiabatic processes. Now, I want to give you the example problem that I am going to be doing in case you want to work on it um, before um, I get a chance to record the video if you're watching this during class time. And that example problem uh, looks like this. We have a cycle. And 
it starts at um, some p max here. And we have our states one, and we're going over here to two, and straight down to three. We have an adiabatic process. That brings us back to one. Um, this here is 600 cubic centimeters. And this is 100 cubic centimeters. And pressure three down here is 100 kilopascals. And we're asked to find, basically, complete the first law table. Complete the first law table. Oh, 600 Kelvin up here at state two. Um, and we're asked to complete the table. Um, and yeah, I think that's all you need for that. Alrighty, time for me to teach class.